Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here. Today joining me is Ken Mishka, who is the founder and chef farmer at the Epiphany Hospitality Group. Um, The Wall Street Journal said they were farm to table 2.0, and they are now in their 11th year of the farm, which provides foods to their restaurant group in central Illinois. Welcome to the podcast, Ken. Thank you for having me. So, Ken, give us a, an overview of the expansive operation you guys manage. Um, okay, so it's been a it's been a big trans couple transition years. Uh, we currently operate on our kind of our dream uh, estate farm. It's a seventy acre farm in central Illinois. Uh, we have ten acres of production vegetable gardens, uh, two acres of vineyard, about fifteen acres of timber. Uh, we have a pretty large event barn uh, that we have been able to rezone as agro-tourism. So we're able to do weddings and mm-hmm. fundraisers and events. Um, there's a home on the estate that we're in the process of turning into a bed and breakfast, a five-bedroom bed and breakfast. About We raise pork, chicken, eggs. Uh, we do a little bit of grass-fed cattle. Uh, we have five, we're opening our fifth restaurant uh, this summer and it's each restaurant is a completely different concept. Mm. We have about eight people at the farm and total 208 on, on payroll. Whoa, because of all the restaurants. Yes, yes. And, and uh, you wouldn't believe how many W-2s we wrote. It was like 434, I think, last year. Wow, wow. Uh, so what's your background? How'd you get into all this? My, my background is uh, culinary arts for the most okay. part. I, I started cooking when I was in eighth grade, uh, went to home economics class in high school, really excelled uh, the, that competitive team kitchen culture. I, 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 I fell in love with it. Kip, kitchen Confidential, Anthony Bourdain. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked at a couple restaurants here in town. There was really nothing for me as far as like high-end technique and traditional uh like kind of like french brigade Mm -hmm. system so i found the culinary institute of america in new york i applied i was actually denied acceptance i wrote a letter seeing if i could petition that i went to a face-to-face interview i talked my way into that school (laughs) i started three weeks after i graduated high school graduated the top of my class uh, moved to, I was in, I did my externship in the Broadmoor in Colorado Springs, a five star mm-hmm. five diamond. And then I convinced five of my friends to move to Las Vegas and go to hospitality school at UNLV. Wow. You sound like a persuasive guy. Y- yeah, I can sell <laughs> ice to an Eskimo for sure. Um, so when did this concept, th- the Epiphany Hospitality Group, when did that concept come about? It was, you know, I really, I had the idea a really long time ago. The The foundation for the idea, I think, kind of dates back to after I graduated culinary school and I moved to Las Vegas, I came home for the summer. I went to a local farmer's market. I, I met a retired contractor who turned farmer named Dave Barron. And I went to his farm and dug my first carrots, dug my first potatoes, mm-hmm. harvested my first peaches, found my first wild mushrooms. And I was blown away. I thought that all we could grow was corn and soybeans in this mm-hmm. region of the country. And it, it blew my mind how productive and how diverse his farm was. I kind of took note of that, moved to Las Vegas. I started working in Vegas for Chef Thomas Keller. Mm-hmm. After I worked for Thomas Keller at Bouchon, I went to Caesar's Palace. I worked at um, James Beard, best new restaurant called Bradley Ogden's. The team had all come from Charlie Trotter's in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And it was at Bradley Ogden's that I really learned a lot about a California sustainable, more seasonal than sustainable, mm-hmm. and a, uh, an ever-changing menu. So we would receive products from the farmers. Uh, we would Whatever we ran out of, we would cross out at, at the pass, reprint the menu every day. It was like, you know, 14, 16 components on every plate, very artistic plate style, very avant-garde. And that, I really loved that. Uh, it, was, it was really enjoyable and challenging to me. And the guys I was around were very inspiring. And I think I, was, I had just turned 22 at the time. And okay. So I, 
I was pretty young and I, um, we were buying about $300 worth of microgreens from the chef's garden in Ohio mm -hmm. every year. Yep. And, uh, I was kind of like, you know what? I could do this. And so yeah. in my, in my bedroom, I got some LED, uh, well, back then they were fluorescent lights yep. and yep. Uh, some cocoa mat. And I started sprouting mustards and beets and radishes and, uh, harvesting them and bringing them to the restaurant and selling them to Caesar's palace. <laughs> and, and I thought I was going to get in trouble for it because I was like using them. And then it gave me leverage in the kitchen against other cooks. But then I thought I was like, kind of like, I don't taking advantage of it a little bit because yeah. I was selling them, but then also using them. And I was actually promoted and celebrated for it. And so that's kind of when the economic side of the epiphany came together. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what, maybe I can actually grow the food I write into my menus. Mm -hmm. Um, after that, I was promoted and asked to open up Guy Savoie. Guy Savoie was uh, a three Michelin star. He is a three Michelin star chef in Paris. They wanted an exact replica of his high-end restaurant in Paris in Caesar's Palace. It was going to be the most expensive a la carte menu in the country. And we had almost an $18 million budget for build out. So it was Whoa. a huge, big expansion um, at this restaurant. And I was the first cook hired on. Uh, Chef Adam Sobel uh, took me under his wing. I worked for him for multiple years, opened up a couple concepts. And at Guy Savoie, I went from serving seasonally sensitive cuisine to French, very pretentious, you know, caviar, foie gras, truffles, saffron on everything. Same <laughs> bowl of soup year round. And I, at the time, read Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan and was completely blown away by the industrialization of our food system and, mm -hmm. and, and how we played a part in that. And I, I finished that book and it must have been like 2005, maybe 2006. And I um, instantly was like epiphany, you know, a sudden moment insight that the future of food would get back to its roots. Uh, creating food that's actually full and regenerative and tons of nutrients and uh, something that has substance and, um, you know, is nutri nutritionally dense. And so that mm -hmm. was the epiphany. I still had two or three years left in business school. Um, a couple other things happened at that time. I was on the, uh, I was on the, I was, I had the opportunity to be interviewed for Top Chef, me and my sous chef, uh, Chef Hong, uh, were asked if we wanted to be on the show. He accepted. I knew that day he was going to win. He went on Top Chef season three, won, annihilated the competition. He got a hundred thousand dollar check, and then named me his manager. And so I spent the next year and a half basically traveling the country, doing food and wine festivals, and being his sous chef at all of these events. Mm -hmm. And so it was there where I was going around the country and realizing that the entire industry was moving towards regenerative, sustainable, seasonal, local production. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of re-encouraged me to think like outside the box and, and willing to risk it all. After graduation in 2008, I moved home. I had saved up $20,000. I bought a greenhouse, uh, 100 laying hens. I bought uh, eight pigs from a feedlot. And a bunch of seeds from the hardware store and basically started failing. <laughs> <laughs> no experience, no clue. And I had this like crazy three year business plan. Um, year one, find some partners. And so I, I had convinced three people to move to central Illinois to help me. I gave them each uh, an even share of the business, 25%. Uh -huh. And then year two is going to be about production models. And year three, we we're going to miraculously open this restaurant. Uh -huh. And so what happened? <laughs> well, everything went pretty well. The, um, I learned a lot gardening. Um, yep. um, I started to kind of like apprentice at Dave Barron's farm, the farmer that I had met five years prior. And by fall time, we were basically out of money. Uh, showing up to the farmer's market, selling $150, to $300 worth of product. Um, very early on, this is, you know, summer of 2009. It was hard for me to find information and mm -hmm. resources and, um, basically we got to a point where we couldn't afford to stay in business without selling dinner parties. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we, we went and we, uh, we go to farmer's markets. We would convince people to book a dinner party and we would go into their home, prep like an eight course meal, show up, crush the dinner, have like almost like a choreographed experience. Um, 
a speech that would talk about our vision, how we want to change the world. And then by the time the guests would get up out of their seat, the kitchen would be perfectly clean, spotless, and they would just want to book another one. And we Uh did from that first September in 2009 till September 2010, we did 115 dinner parties. Wow. Yeah. So we do almost three a week by, by the end of it. And so that's what saved your farm. That's what cash flowed us for, for two years. It cash flowed us and allowed us to stay in business and keep, keep working towards, you know, trying to get this restaurant. And we found a space in a place called downtown Bloomington, Illinois. And we convinced the landlord to give us free rent until we opened. And we spent six months in there kind of demoing it and trying to find investors, trying to go to banks and really couldn't find much uh, as far as um, backing. But there was a restaurant down the street that I kind of started to consult at. It was a really, really big historic building. It had been there for 35 years, the restaurant. It's an original fire station from 1901. And I started telling this owner like, hey, here, here's the direction you need to go. Here's what you need to fix. And long story short, but a year after we had started kind of having conversations, we were offered to step in as temporary chefs. Mm. So we, we stepped in as temporary chefs. We did an event and we saw that the space had tons of opportunity, but just was a completely broken culture. Mm-hmm. And so we decided that if he was willing to give us cre- complete creative control uh, and if he agreed to allow us to turn his business around and then value his business and the building, then we would be willing to turn it around and try to buy it. Mm-hmm. And so he, uh, part of the agreement was that he was going to co-sign and help us get the loan to buy some land. And so we found a 10 acre homestead that we could turn into a homestead. It had two barns. It had, you know, really rich soil, about four acres of gardens. And we bought this property with his help. And then we just started working, you know, day and night on this property and running this restaurant, which was at the time was called Station 220. Okay. So we started working there. Uh, It took us nine months to start turning things around. We then drew up a contract, uh, made an agreement for purchase. And then it, it wasn't for another two and a half years till we could actually afford to make mortgage payments and to start buying the business. Uh, it was, we had 35 employees. Uh, we were a, a big expansive restaurant. We were only doing a little less than a million a year. And so it really wasn't financially working. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then after time and after we kept on grinding, serving better food, um, working with the community, it, it, it slowly started to snowball. And after two and a half years, we, we got it to a point where we actually were paying down the mortgage, buying the business. It was officially ours. We took the second floor, remodeled it, and turned it into our second restaurant called Anju Above. Uh, it was a failed bar before. That restaurant was going to be the exact opposite of our downstairs restaurant. So downstairs is like uh, globally inspired, personally produced, local farm to table. It's mm-hmm. got a French, but my wife is Korean, so it's also got like a little bit of Korean um, undertones. And then Anju is an open kitchen battle of two cuisines. So there's two kitchens on each side of the dining room, sushi versus pizza. And Whoa. Yeah, it's crazy. And basically, we wanted to create a space that was the exact opposite of our other restaurant. And so this was a very lively space. It felt like you're in downtown Chicago. There was Neapolitan style pizzas, wings, ramen, donuts, pretzels. And then we had sushi and dumplings and uh, hand rolls. It sounds and like heaven. It, it, it is the coolest restaurant. It's been open almost six years and it's still our number one concept. Um, my friends that were on Top Chef came for the opening. We sold it out. It was a real big deal. And that really... That, that dining room has stayed busy for us. It has 98 seats and it's stayed busy for us now for six years. Wow. And that was really what, you know, kind of fixed that property in a lot of ways. But so we were, we did that. Anju was uh, five and a half years ago. It'll, and then we found another space uh, downtown, a failed restaurant. We took that over, remodeled it, turned into our bakery um, and our commissary kitchen. So we would take the surplus We take the surplus product, the carrots, the onions, all that stuff, and turn it into pickles. Mm -hmm. And we did this for like two and a half years. And then after we did that, we we ended up opening up a restaurant in my hometown in Leroy, Illinois. We found an old bank. 
uh, took that over, turned it into an Americana restaurant. And then we remodeled a year and a half ago the bakery and turned it into a Prohibition era speakeasy. Oh, fun. Really a cool uh, concept, uh, very eclectic. It's got charcuterie and pinchos, and uh, there's everything from a burger all the way to a huge tomahawk steak. There's oysters on the half shell. And right now, we bought a building in another area of Bloomington, and we're opening up a restaurant called Harmony, which is going to be a modern Korean barbecue. Oh, that sounds fun, too. Yeah, it's it, so so we have the, it'll be the five concepts and then the farm, which I'm the chef of the farm and I do all the dinners and uh, weddings and stuff there. Mm-hmm. So with all this going on, what does a typical day look like for you? About a year and a half ago, uh, I took the opportunity. My brother had been working with me for eight years and he was my livestock manager in the beginning and then became farm manager. Okay. And he wanted, he got married. He wanted to change careers. He wants to be in law enforcement. And so last January, I took the opportunity to take over the farm full time and become the farm manager. And so now I have three children, my wife, Nanam, Uh, we Mm -hmm. live at the farm. And I basically was, you know, up until four or five in the morning every night. I was always coming home late, uh, you know, always kind of like in this like weird kind of hospitality mm-hmm. you know, space where you get done with a, work, you just want to blow off steam and go to a bar. Yeah, it's a tough and business. It's a very tough business. And I think it's it's interesting that you, you know, they sacrifice themselves for others and it's it's a really weird space to be in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that and farming, it's like trying to put them both together, like both very hard margin businesses. And I'm like, well, if you can make that work, you probably make any business work almost. Yeah, but the two are so complimentary. I mean, yeah, everything that's bad about a restaurant is, is is the opposite with a farm, and it's like the farm is like the best recharging station for anyone that works in restaurants. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, all the hurdles a diversified small scale or mid sized farm faces, being connected to a couple restaurants, it really helps solve those hurdles. And 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 it's so they're very complimentary. And and a, and a to a point where I, I could not see myself doing it without both. Okay. So talk to us a little bit about what the crop mix is at the farm, because you've got a bunch of different things going on there. Yes. Um, currently we are about 50, 50 protein and veg with okay. a small slice of fruit and wild forage products. So uh, we have 11 sows and a boar. And so we're raising about 220, 240 hogs a year. Okay. Uh, we this year are planning on doing 6,800 broilers on pasture, just like the Joel Salatin model. Uh-huh. And we have 700 laying hens. Okay. We had eight steers that we brought to market uh, over the winter. And we're right now kind of rebuilding. We, we, the, the old farm, the 10 acres has been a year and a half been trying to sell it. And so we close knock on wood next week on the 17th. Okay, so you had that 10 acre parcel. Now you're being able to get rid of that. So that's going to allow you free you up probably with some capital as well as yes. just time onto the new place. Yes, it's been a three year transition moving the farm and getting all the systems that we had set up there here at the bigger property. And, you know, pretty much everything we did at the other farm was, you know, DIY, small scale, market gardener. And then mm-hmm. now everything at the new farm is a, a, a bigger scale you know it's mm-hmm. it's tractor planted tractor cultivated um, harvest assist but we didn't have greenhouses at the new property and we don't have a pack house at the new property mm-hmm. so just in end of uh, january early february we got our first uh, 30 by 96 greenhouse up mm-hmm. um, so we could get the season rolling we have plans to put two more of those up in the fall next to it and then I took down a 30 by 72 at the old farm and I'm going to rebuild that as a prop house. So right now we kind of have like a temporary prop house on one side of the big greenhouse. Yep. Um, and then, so this fall, I'll get that done. We're going to do radiant heat in floor. I have a little, uh, you know, one of those like fabric hoop structures, mm-hmm. the temporary buildings that I build for a birthing barn and a brooder for the chickens. And we're about to put another one of those up as a five year kind of temporary pack house. Perfect. Yeah, those are actually quite nice. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're great for a lot of reasons. Now, my, my question to you would be is you're probably hitting the FISMA regulations, right? Well, yeah, now that now that, uh, you know, the exemption is only 25,000. We were right under it because it was it was a quarter of a million average sales for three years. 
Uh-huh. And we were right there. So we were right at it. The last three years have been right about a quarter of a million in production. Yeah. And, and then half being protein, the other half being veg. But the income stream of the farm is, is also half of the production. And then the other half of our income is management fees. So the way that I designed this company is that the farm actually manages the restaurants. So th- this way, the production can pay for cost of goods sold, mm-hmm. as well as all my labor and, and basic other like supplies and upkeep, things like that. But then the hospitality group income is what's actually paying the mortgage, paying for the taxes, and then paying for people like media and videography, my wife's salary as uh, administrative director and CFO, mm-hmm. uh, HR, and then office administration. So Very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's a completely different kind of like hybrid hospitality group model. Yeah. Okay. So then you also do a lot of catering events and the event barn on the farm too. Yes. And, and that's, that was all, you know, this, this property was, um, it was on the market for $1.1 million and it required an additional 200000 to bring it up to code just to get the agro-tourism um, not exemptions, but the new reclassification. Yeah. And so I was working on it for almost seven years talking to him because it was always a dream of mine to buy this property yeah. and turn it into that. So the purchase was actually in contingent to us getting this rezoning. That, uh-huh. rezoning, that rezoning came into effect last year, early in the spring. And so we were completely legal with all, all 20 events that we did last year. So we did 11 weddings last year and we had nine other miscellaneous events and, and uh, a really big fundraiser. Wow. And I saw some of the pictures of those events. So if you guys definitely want to go check out the website and see those pictures, because it's, it's beautiful stuff. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's all, it's a dream come true in a lot of ways. It's really, yeah, I can imagine. So, all right. So you got the crop mix. So you're also doing some longer term cropping on there, like some tree crops and stuff. Talk to us about that side of the farm. So I've always been interested in, you know, permaculture design and, you know, growing my own timber and my own fence posts and things like that. And it just was always kind of like this balance between what can I afford and how much can I invest towards these long term cropping systems. Uh Um, I had a lot of them like smaller amounts. So like I had 50 hazelnuts and 20 chestnuts and then lots of orchards like almost four acres or three and a half acres worth of edges mm-hmm. on the old farm that I had planted. Those are all now entering their like sixth, seventh and eighth season, but we just sold them. So this farm, I'm actually at a fresh start. Mm-hmm. Um, we're doing a nut, nut tree nut propagation workshop this Saturday at the farm. Uh, we'll have 30 uh, people coming to attend. So I have like pecans, heart nuts, chestnuts, hazelnuts, all being started from seed as well as whips being transplanted on this property. Uh, I put in a thousand hazelnuts two years ago. I have plans to put in a hundred chestnuts this year. And I have 12 acres of timber that I've been for the last two years working on restoring. So Uh kind of going in, getting rid of the honeysuckle, uh, transplanting, yeah, cleaning it up and then transplanting other wild edibles that I've found on other properties in the area and then bringing them here, whether it's through seed or, or actual root transplant. So I've oh, very been cool. very successful at being able to propagate ramps, wild onions, uh, different types of mushrooms, sweet Sicily, uh, those, those types of, of forage crops that provide a lot of income, you know, in the next like month and a half when we're stuck in the greenhouses and not in the field yet. Exactly, exactly. All right. So let's talk about the transition from going from the other property to this property. I mean, always resetting up a farm is so much fun because you have like free creative license. What are kind of the things that you you wanted to make sure you built into this new farm to make you more successful? The, the agro-tourism perspective of it, like that ability to not not just, you know, gather and quickly walk around the farm to see these like systems and not being just so DIY where uh-huh. it's like anyone can do this. I really wanted to break down each system and then rebuild it in a much more professional uh, kind of like a larger wholesale type style. And so, for instance, in the past, you know, we, we would make our own charcoal out of, uh, you know, 55 gallon drums and uh, we, but now I'm like looking into how do we build out a real legit, you know, charcoal oven so we can have good, solid production of it. And it's just the problem is that they're so capital intensive and uh-huh. when you're trying to do things at a larger scale it, and to do them right, 
it's expensive. And so yeah. it, it, it's taken me a little longer to get a lot of these systems set up. And I kind of feel like we're maybe a little behind in some respects. Um, but I'm also making sure that I do them right because, you know, when you just do it quick, it might work. You might be able to beta test it and, and test the model and, you know, grow mushrooms for two years or, you know, make charcoal for a little while or do these other fun things, but they're not really going to last and, and be profitable for a long time. Uh-huh. And so that's one thing I've really been paying a lot of attention to. We're doing hay rack rides. So when the guests arrive, we get on a hay rack ride, we meet at the event barn and I've made basically like this, this tractor tour of the farm where oh, we fun. hit each of the systems. And so we just finished cutting a path through the timber so we can go through all the wood crops and show them that. Um, and then also come through, you know, where the sows are, where the boar is, where the breeding plots are, where we call it a uh, hog heaven way, where all the, all the <laughs> yeah. growers are. And then you hit the broilers, the laying hens, the pack, you know, which will be the pack house, the hoop barn, the greenhouses, and then the gardens. And then when you come back, you usually finish with a uh, non-alcoholic beverage and a small farm meal, whether it's a lunchbox or a like buffet spread. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So you're set up it intentionally so you can do that. And how much do you charge for the tour? This year, it's we've always asked for a $10 donation. And this year, we're officially going to $10 per guest. Mm-hmm. So basically, the way that works is if they come for a farm tour, it's $10 per person. If someone wants to book a wedding and they have 200 guests, then it's uh, $2,000. So it's $10 per guest paid to the farm. That helps pay for insurance, um, maintenance, upkeep of the buildings, plumbing, things like that. Yeah. And then if, if it's a local non-for-profit or school, then this year I'm, I'm charging $5 per person. Gotcha. Very interesting. So you're going to have a large, well, it's going to be a, a significant revenue stream to have people on the farm. Yeah. And that, that's the intention. We're really trying to grow out the, the um, agritourism and yeah. the tour side of it. And also the harvest feast and the dinners, uh, that, that's really our bread and butter. And it's, it's really great for us to be able to kind of like connect those dots and do it here at the farm site. Uh-huh. And, so that, and then long term, you know, I'm moving out. I live at the farm now, but I'm, we just bought a home. I'm moving out in June and we're going to turn this home into a five bedroom bed and breakfast so that guests who come to this farm can just be completely immersed for an entire weekend and stay here and experience it. And, you know, I try to make magic happen and inspire people in a, you know, hour and a half or two hour meal. And I'm just so excited about the opportunity to be able to inspire someone over a course of three days. And that's, mm-hmm. that's really what I'm excited about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Very interesting. Now, as a farmer, there are always endless tasks to be done. How do you make sure that you focus on what needs to be done every day? The votes, vital things. I think it's, you know, it really is all about the team and the culture. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a lot of list, a lot of prioritizing, uh, a lot of observation. I, I feel some days I'm not getting a lot done, but I'm really trying to connect all the dots and put things down and, and, and delegate and lead people. And so I I think that it's really about having a good solid core structure. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Um, I mean, at, at this point I have 19 salaried managers, uh, two of which are at the farm. So I have a livestock manager, Grady Ryan, and then I have a sales and CSA manager, Kalen Buss. And those are my two main go-tos. I also mm-hmm. have some other employees that, one that Jacob is a returning farmer and he's in charge of the greenhouse. And then I have Luisio who's a returning farmhand who's in charge of the grounds and the vineyard. And so he's, you know, doing all the landscaping, doing the mowing, mm-hmm. and kind of really tuning in that, the, the top part of the property. Uh, And then other than that, one other kind of leverage that we have is that every employee that works in our company, in our companies, the hospitality group, Mm -hmm. has to fulfill one shift per season at the farm. Oh, okay. Yep. So what happens is when they get onboarded, they get told about the farm, they get inspired about it, they get a clock in at the farm. And then if I need hands a week prior when I'm writing the schedule, I reach out to all my managers and say, Hey, next Wednesday, we're cutting a path through the timber. I need hands. Mm -hmm. And then they'll put a sign up sheet and say eligible farm hours on Wednesday from 10 AM till 2 PM. Mm -hmm. And and then I bring them out and I just care for them, take care of them. Maybe you have a little bit of a lunch. uh, and, And then they can either get paid hourly wage or mm-hmm. they can elect to get a gift card, which is like a little bit more than what they would make if it was an hourly wage. 
Oh, fascinating. So what would you say the hardest thing you've done in this whole process has been? There's so many things, but I, at the end of the day, I, I think it's, it's been about acquiring, it's weird, acquiring debt and acquiring capital. It was, you know, it was so hard for us to convince investors or banks in the beginning that we, we ended up just giving up on it. And we're uh-huh. like, you know what, let's just do this ourselves. And so we have reinvested every dime. We've sold zero equity of our businesses. And it's, the first five years was about proving that it could work. And then the next five years was about acquiring debt and getting capital to be able to take on these bigger projects. Uh-huh. And then now it's kind of like, well, now we need to step up to the plate and, you know, hit, hit a home run. And so that, uh-huh. that's, that's where we're at. Um, yeah. Right now, now it's generate the income to start paying back down that debt and actually make this a, 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 pro- a profitable enterprise. Exactly. And, and we're, you know, I, I would say we're kind of far from that. We, I think in the next two years, I'm really hoping to increase production and I want to get to at least 400, even, even a half a million in production per year. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's what's, what's needed. The end goal, when we sat down about four years ago and kind of like put down the, the plan for the next 10 years, the, the goal is to, to generate 10 million in food and beverage revenue and then a half million in production and a half million in um, management fees. Interesting. So, you know, I, I think one thing I'm hearing you say too is that you've been playing the long game the whole time. There's a lot of people that would, if they couldn't have done it in three years would have given up. Yeah, I think, I think our, our resilience as chefs, you know, and like <laughs> our ability to fail and, and learn from it. I, I, you know, a chef is really good at, at making mistakes and, and innovating and, and, and bouncing back. You know, you, you overcook the pasta and, you know, you're 25 minutes away from reboiling water and having perfectly al dente pasta. And in a, in a farm, you know, you miss your spring opportunity to put carrots in. Yeah. You're not going to have, you're not going to have another chance for another 12 months or 11 months. So I think it's that resilience that we've practiced in the kitchen that we've applied to these systems that has really given us some advantage when it, it's just like, even though we completely failed, that's just, that's just do it again. You know, that's make it happen. And that's, that, that's a really like an underlying thing to us. Like we get knocked down a lot, but we, we just get up and we just make ourselves stronger. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. With that, I'd like to stop here and take a quick break. In a minute, we'll be back with Ken from Epiphany Hospitality Group. If you've been enjoying this episode so far, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download our free resource bundle to help you shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer. It includes resources such as our 10 winter growing secrets we wish we knew when we started, which is a ebook which talks about the tips and techniques to get better growth in your winter production. We teach things like the simple but counterintuitive principle that trips up most beginning growers, the shape and size of tunnels that are best for winter production, how to prepare beds so they are weed free and get beautiful lush stands of crops, what to do about pests like aphids, voles, and slugs, how to fast track your research to fine tune your production for your microclimate, and how to pack in more crops for higher yields and profits. So head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download your free resource bundle today. Hey, Thriving Farmers. So we are back with Ken Mishka from Epiphany Farms Hospitality Group. Ken, who are your mentors in all of this? That's a great question. I mean, Joel Salatin, huge. I met Mm -hmm. him in 2009 at a conference, and uh, I've been a big fan ever since. I finally got to go to Polyface last year. It was an amazing experience. Elliot Coleman, Mm -hmm. knocked meeting him off my bucket list a couple years ago, and He's really inspired me. And then, um, I mean, a big fan of permaculture, Bill Mollison, mm-hmm. uh, David Holmgreen, and uh, my, my favorite book, One Straw Revolution. So Masanobu Fukuoka, it, those were the mm-hmm. four that I really gravitated towards. Very cool. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, maybe we kind of discussed this a little bit, but if there's like a magic reset button as it relates to starting your farm, what systems would you go back and put in place sooner? Oh man, these are some good questions. I think, I, um, no, I, I think just 
not always trying to do so much, like mm-hmm. being happy with, you know, with that, like with the game plan. You know, I, I, in the past, I would be like, oh yeah, we need, you know, we need 50 types of tomatoes. We need 30 types of peppers. We need, you know, every type of lettuce. And I would just have these unrealistic goals. And then I find myself mid season falling behind on management because I'm just trying to take care of too much. Mm-hmm. I, and and I used to get started so early and I'd always just want to push the envelope on how fast can I get started and then you know but my conditions in the field aren't ready and so by the time I actually get my plants in the field they're a little leggy they're a little root bound uh-huh. and so you know just just kind of like game planning sticking to it and, and and having really really good tight clean management of it mm-hmm. so you know i always say to my my leadership team i always tell them you know it's it's really not how good you are or how good you think you are it, it's all the perception of what other people think about how good you're doing and if if someone walks onto my, my farm or comes into one of my departments or systems and you know it's chaotic and it's a mess then i'm failing and, mm-hmm. it, and and not failing in a successful way i'm failing you know obviously failing and so i i like to just really focus on the perception of each of the departments and each of the areas that we're, we're managing. And, you know, I'm a clean freak when it comes to organizational behavior and the, the farm and the culture and, you know, that, those kind of things. And I, we do have some pretty crazy like chef tendencies when it comes to our rules. Like I get a little annoyed if someone like tries to give me a bunch of excuses or something. It's just like, listen, man, you just say yes, chef. It's like really Uh simple. Um, uh-huh. And so I don't, I don't know. It's definitely a, a chef kind of perspective out here. Even though I'm farming full time, I'm, I'm still a chef at heart. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. So let's talk to us about your team. Um, how do you divide roles on the farm? Um, well, it really uh, just through communication and, and, and meeting with them and, and trying to put people as close to their spotlight as possible. Uh, so, you know, I, I, the farm team is, is relatively easy for me just because there's only like, you know, six or seven, sometimes eight people. Um, it's, I, when I took over the farm from my brother, I had no returning farm staff. And so last season was really difficult for me. New farm, mm-hmm. uh, still managing two properties no returning farm staff. I think, you know, I turned over my, my spring farm team. I, I turned them all over pretty much. And, uh, but by the end of last season, I really, I got some things figured out. I, you know, Grady got up to speed when it came to the management of the animal side of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, I uh, promoted Kalen from working at the restaurants uh, to coming out and, and taking over as, a, as the farm administrative sales manager. And then I found Luisio. Luisio is this angel that uh came to the farm in the fall and helped me uh with harvesting last year and and then i was able to convince him to walk away from two other jobs i gave him a management position and his new role as grounds manager uh you know in field maintenance is that's really awesome uh and then that's oh and then ben i've had a a friend of mine um ben i call him ben the mushroom man he (laughs) he showed up to the farm uh the restaurant about eight years ago with a, a bag of uh, wild edibles. And I was like, where'd you get all this? I'm like, Oh my gosh, I, I didn't know we can get chanterelles. And mm-hmm. he's like, and so I went, I started hanging out with him and uh, he's retired and we go foraging together and he uh, has restored his Jeep. And then he ended up restoring a, a G Alice Chalmers tractor yep. for us. And he worked with my brother, but him and my brother had similar skill sets. They're both very mechanical and I am not very mechanical and so I started reaching back out to Ben uh, mid-season last year, and I got him to come back two days a week. And so now, you know, all winter, he's been here two days a week, helping with preventive maintenance, helping with restoring some of the old tractors. And uh, that, you know, having someone to manage that is, is huge. Um, we also mm-hmm. have a, a facilities manager named Jerry Lay. And Jerry is in charge of the five restaurant locations. And so he also is a resource for me to be able to call and say, Hey, you know, the, the, like right now my truck is leaking transmission fluid and he's on it, you know, and Mm -hmm. I can call him last minute and he's there, which is, you know, it's really one of the benefits that we have having access to such a large group. Um, It it, it definitely makes, gives us an advantage. I don't see at most farms. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the things that so many struggle with farmers is, is the hiring and keeping great teams. Just, just share your, your wisdom on that because you have such a big team. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the team is everything. I, I, I don't think that people want much more in life than to be a part of a, a really great team. I love being on a high functioning team. I was never an all-star. I was never a great basketball player, or good at football, anything, but I love being on a team. And I, mm-hmm. I love being the, the hardest worker in practice. And I love lifting other people up. And so that's definitely my spotlight. What, one thing that I've never delegated, we, me and Chef Stu, it, it, currently it's me, Chef Stu, and Anam were the three partners. Mike Mustard left in uh, 2011, who was my original partner. Mm-hmm. And we, we have never delegated interviewing and hiring. So and even though I have 19 managers, I hire and I interview everyone every week. And any single person that fills out an application gets a face-to-face conversation. And we do it via a group interview and it's an hour and 15 minutes. Every week it averages between four to 14 people. And I have like almost a micro orientation, but we start out by just going to each person that attends the interview and ask them, what do they wanna be? Who do they wanna be? What do they see themselves? What, what position do they see themselves in and in what type of experience do they have to allow them to succeed at that position? All right. And wait, wait, after, wait a minute. You do a group interview. Yes. Every week. I, I, we started doing this in 2010. I, have, I will never go away from it. Fascinating. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, it's quick. I mean, it takes an hour and 15. Sometimes they run a little long. Uh, but the thing is, is that anyone, anyone, that fills out an application gets invited to the next group. It doesn't matter if they have seven felonies, they're coming to group. It's that mm-hmm. simple. And we meet face to face. And and after this hour and 15 minute meeting, they learn, you know, they learn what makes us click and what mm-hmm. we are inspired about and what, what our goals are. But I also learn about them. I learn that they want to open their own business or they want to go to school for this one thing, or they just need to feed their family, or they're, you know, fresh out of prison and need a second opportunity, a second chance. And so I learn about them and then I recommend placement. And so I rate them with, it's really simple, green light, red light, yellow light. So green light, this person is amazing. And here's where I think that they would fit in really well. They yeah. need to get brought on the team. Yellow light is, then let's leave, let's not contact them for a week. If they reach back out to us, then a department manager can have a second interview. Mm-hmm. And then a red light is, um, you're not qualified for a position currently, but you can reapply in six months. Oh, Interesting. And anyone that I fire or term, they can reapply in six months. And so do you give them a list of things that you want them to fix at that point? Yes, absolutely. If it, uh, basically, the rule with management is if they make any adjustment to an employee's schedule that, like, let's just say they take away a Tuesday or they change their position or something, if anything is adjusted on an employee's schedule, there has to be a conversation about the reason why. That's very, very important. And if we don't hire someone, we get, we, I contact Megan uh, helps me set up. She's my director of restaurant operations and she helps me set up the group interviews. And the next day we contact every single one that came to the group interview and, and get them kind of like more insight to like what's going on or how long it's going to take to get them onboarded. Uh So then after the group interview, we uh, send them to orientation. Uh, Orientation is, is filtered filter uh, is orientation and she takes notes on if the employee shows up if they are active engaged uh, how they're dressed and so they think they're just going to an orientation but you know if they went if they do great at the group interview and they really really gel but then they show up to orientation and they're like not taking notes and they're falling asleep they'll just get yeah. let go they'll like get let go at that point and so we're really quick to hire and really really quick to fire Interesting. So, okay. So they survive the group interview, they get into the orientation and that's just kind of like a meeting where they just learn more about the company or you actually have them do stuff. Um, they have to make sure that they have like food handlers, uh, Bassett, if they're going to be serving alcohol and then they have to go through the handbook and the handbook is pretty expansive because it has all the rules of each of the restaurants plus the farm rules. And so it, it takes about, it's almost about two hours to do a good job. And we pay them for that time, obviously. And then, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they get their swag or whatever parts of the uniform that they need to fulfill their job. And then they go and they start their first shift. And it's not until um, 
one thing that we're actually, we stopped doing it for a few years, but we're getting back to it is after 20 shifts, we send out a peer evaluation form to all the employees they work with and then their peers evaluate their performance. And then the last question on the peer evaluation is, if you were the owner, would you hire this person? Oh, wow. And so if employees say no, then we make note of that. And in the past, we'd always kind of say that like owners can like veto a no, but if someone has multiple no's, then we just simply say like, it's not gonna fit, it's not gonna work out, um, you can reapply in six months. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's only happened a few times in you know the last 10 years, but um, it is a really cool tool of empowering your staff and letting your staff know that they, they have a voice in the onboarding process of your team and building your team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like right now, I think you have 14 jobs on your website available. So you're always hiring. You're always hiring. You always are getting in like four to 14 or so people a week and then they go right through this process. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it's, you know, you're basically hiring to um, replace, not hiring to fill positions. Okay, because with that high of number of people in your in your organization, as well as being in the restaurant industry, you always are going to have turnover. Exactly, and and, and I I try not to use that word. Um, mm-hmm. Or yeah, the turnover, because and I, I learned this. I was staging at a restaurant called Elenia in Chicago way back in the day, and when it right when it opened, and I asked Grant Atkins, I said, "How do you deal with all this turnover?" And he told me, he's like, "No, no, it's not turnover. It's pass through." You got to think about it differently. If you can, if you can onboard someone and train them, and then when they leave, they actually do a better job training the next person, then you didn't really turn anyone over. You actually just passed all that knowledge through to the next person. Mm-hmm. And so I'll even bonus out, you know, if a manager's with me for a couple of years and they're getting ready to leave, I ask them, okay, who is going to take over your role? And I bring them in on the process of replacement and I'll even bonus them out if there's a smooth transition from position to position. Wow. Okay. So then, all right, with that many people on board too, you obviously can't have your eyes and ears everywhere. How do you, ma- you obviously have to build the middle management. How have you empowered the middle management to make all of this work? Well, they're, they're kind of in charge, you know, they're, they're in charge of their departments and they're in charge of the, the culture of the department. They, every department has to do a daily pre-shift meeting. So they have okay. daily meetings with their team. Uh, they're in charge of uh, raises. They're in charge of scheduling. They're in charge of write-ups. Okay. And then we, we meet with our managers uh, regularly. So we do these management retreats where we take all 19 managers, we leave for the day. And we just talk strategy and challenges. And yeah, even today, because of the deal with this virus, we have an emergency mm-hmm. management meeting today, this afternoon. And so everyone will come to corporate office and we're going to have a half an hour just like, hey, here's the decisions that are being made. Here's how we're moving forward. And then they go from there. And then to keep the company kind of moving in the right direction, we do these things called quarterly updates. So it starts on a Monday night and it's every three months and we bring all employees in um, voluntarily. We provide drink, food, uh, beer, wine, and entertainment. And we kind of make it like a micro three hour conference. So we'll have like guest speakers, we'll have panel discussions, um, we do a raffle, we do prizes, we will vote on new handbook rules. Like recently we've had a lot of, we had a very uh, conservative handbook rule when it came to hairstyle Mm -hmm. and tattoos. And and so we allowed the staff to vote on that. And they actually obviously voted that there should be no rules on hair color. And so we had to scratch that. (laughs) So now you have a rainbow. (laughs) Yeah, now we have rainbows, yep. (laughs) Yeah, and and all these weird other things that are happening, but, You know, we have this like really fun meeting and uh, I believe in open book accounting and open book management. So I, we share our struggles with them and we challenge them and, you know, and I, we're actually, it's really cool to see it happen because we have people that worked here six, seven years ago that worked for us for a few years. They, you know, they drank the Kool-Aid, they got into it. Then they left, they moved to Colorado or California. They do their thing. They grow up. And now they're actually coming back, trying to raise families in this area, and they're coming back to work for us. And, and, and it brings such amazing energy and culture and understanding of what we're all about. 
and they come back and it's just like this awesome shot of energy. It's great. And so that's mm. a, that's a big thing for me. And so now I'm really starting to figure out how do I reconnect with my alumni? Because mm-hmm. we have, you know, we have 208, we'll hire 42 more for this next restaurant at least. And, but we wrote 430 W2s last year. So we have thousands of employees that have come through our system that are mm-hmm. out around the country doing their thing. Mm-hmm. And so now I, you know, we did this thing about six years ago. We, we had them fill out a time capsule and asking them where they're going to be in six years. What are they going to do? Um, where are they going to live? What are they going to drive? And, and then what is happiness to them? And then we put them in envelopes. We sealed them up. We had them put their parents' cell phone and their parents' address, their address and their cell phone. And we locked them in the top safe. And Megan was just telling me that she's like, oh, I got to get this sent out. So she's right now trying to find the addresses to send these time capsules back to these employees. And there's no doubt in my mind, my, my mind that of the 50 people we're sending these time capsules to, one or two is going to contact us and be like, I got to come back. I want to be mm-hmm. back a part of this culture. And yeah. so that, that's, that's really cool to me. And that's, you know, that's, a, that's important. That's really, really important. Okay, one thing you said there, the open book accounting, talk to us about that because we always believed in that on our farm. And, you know, at the end of every week, our um, bookkeeper, Missy, would, um, and she was just a general office manager and my basically a godsend to me. I could not have run the company without her. Um, she would write the total sales for that week on the board. And then, you know, the team would filter through the office throughout the day, you know, checking it and talking to each other about, yes, we're up like $300. Right. But I hear, I hear so many farms like, oh, I don't want to share with how much money we're making. And I think farmers need to be transparent about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's such a, I mean, everyone thinks I'm rich. It's crazy because of how much we have. And it's like, that's not the case. Like you're leveraged. We're, <laughs> yeah, we're leveraged. And we're, we're, we're <laughs> We're generating a lot of revenue. I mean, I think we're at like, you know, this year we're hoping to hit like 4.8 million, but it's 4.8 million in and 4.8 million out. Mm -hmm. And so the bottom line is the fact that we're barely making it. And even though, but people don't understand that. So it's really important. You don't, we don't like say like, Hey, here's how much you're making and here's how much someone else is making. But we do believe in like ranges. So when you get hired on, we let them know, like you're going to get hired on at at 10 to $11 per hour, but you can get up to 1450. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you can become a junior manager at 32 or 35, but we have some managers that are mid fifties and we let them know that range. And then we share labor percentage total sales. We have a break even sales mark, which is more of like, kind of like an estimate, like this location needs to do 14,000 per week to break even. Mm -hmm. And it's just a number that we kind of like, I I kind of have a feeling for, you know, reviewing P and L's and understanding balance sheets. I, I set a break even, and then we give that information to our managers and we allow them to talk about it to their staff. And that's important. And then at those quarterly updates, I let them know, did we hit our sales goals? Did we uh, control our cost well enough? Um, how are we doing on cost of goods? Are we, what's best? Is our wine the best? Is our beer the best? Is liquor our best? Or are we doing a great job with food? And we talk about all of that kind of stuff. And it's really not about profiting and all that good stuff. And I, I always tell my staff, like, you know, one of the coolest things about our company is that we're not, we're not owned by owners. We, Mm -hmm. it's the three of us, we're all working together. And my dream is to see each of these businesses sold to its leaders. And so that I could have them buy in for the rest of their life, not necessarily just, you know, for a, for a job. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, it's an interesting kind of thing. I think we go back and forth. I I like to just be able to give out the P and L's and be like, Hey, take a look, man. I got nothing to hide. Uh, Mm -hmm. But my wife and I'm, she, she definitely keeps a, a closer eye and it's like, no, it's, that's not released these numbers because they're a little bit confidential and sensitive. That's, that's just make this spreadsheet that has the key numbers that they need to see. And then that's released that. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. All right. Let's move into marketing because obviously to do what you do, you have to have a marketing machine going on. How are you focusing on, on that? Because you, and you obviously have so many different marketing streams. So every single restaurant probably has right. to have its own. Talk a little bit about your strategy. Um, it, you know, we always did a grassroots uh, marketing strategy, you know, just like from a, a view from within uh, doing Facebook and Instagram back in the day, mostly Facebook. Um, 
And then it was about three years ago, we were really starting to try to outsource some things and find someone that could help us with graphic design and videographer, videography. Whenever we open up a new concept or whenever we want to launch something, we try to do a cool video. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I can remember our very first video that we did. It was, a, it was a kid that was going to school to become a videographer. He was a dishwasher and we just paid him to come and start filming us. And, but then three years ago, we had a, a, a guy by the name of Mike Richards who joined the company, he actually came through a group interview applying to be a prep cook. Okay. And, but in the group interview, I found out that he was going to school for videography and media and marketing. Mm -hmm. And you were and like, like, yes. <laughs> yeah, in the, yeah, exactly. And so, so it was only like a month or so he was working garmage at Epiphany Farms and which is like the salad station. And I think me and Stu started encouraging him like, Hey, don't worry about bringing your knife tomorrow. Just bring your camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're like, yeah. Just, so uh, he was a senior in college. He ended up uh, graduating. And once he graduated, we put together a package for him to be our first full-time uh, marketing and media manager. And so he, he's been in that position now for two years. And so we have a full-time uh, videographer that helps me with presentations, helps with recording, does all the videos, does all the training videos, um, and then manages all of the social media. Very cool. So oh. then each, does each restaurant have its own unique marketing flair though? You're, you're obviously because they're focused on different things, I guess, different themes would come out. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's kind of the secret. Um, there's a big restaurant group that kind of like created the whole model of diversified concepts in the same community called Lettuce Entertain You. They have hundreds of restaurants now, but oh wow, back in the day, what they would do is they realized that if we take the, the same concept, then we got to find a market that's similar to this one and we can't put it in the same market. So mm -hmm. then you put your next restaurant, you know, maybe 45 minutes away or two hours away. And then as you grow out these, these locations, you become really wide and spread out over a large geographical region. Well, let us entertain you prove that they could open up multiple restaurants on the same block, but by being separate concepts, they could actually kind of like, um, one plus one is not two, right? They're, they're, mm -hmm, they're mm -hmm. complementary to each other. One so plus each one restaurant, three. exactly. And so each restaurant is designed to not compete, but to also just give another option for our fans. Mm -hmm. So that's really key. So like our restaurant in Leroy, it's, you know, in a really, it's a bedroom community of Bloomington Normal. Um, they can only afford maybe $14 to $18 meals total. And so that, marketing and that restaurant and that menu is all designed around that price point, that check average. Mm -hmm. And so, which is interesting from my perspective, because I think, you know, always working in fine dining and really high end spots, there's so much pressure mm -hmm. and there's so much like just stress around like, Oh my gosh, you know, this is the most expensive meal of someone's life. And I got to hit a home run. Otherwise you know, I'm going to be, a, we're going to be a failure. And, and all of a sudden when I started opening up, fast casual restaurants I'm yeah like, oh wow this is like it's not stressful at all i can show up in my boots and my you know my farm clothes and hang out and, and have a few beers and you know how was your burger and they're like burger was awesome it's like all right cool thanks good to see you come back tomorrow and yeah it's not like you know and, and and that's something we like i think i think more fast casual is key and we're kind of dialing in where's that price point have to be so harmony is going to be like at dinner like 28 bucks you know we mm -hmm. won't do and, and get out and, and then be able to come back the next week, not the next anniversary. Mm -hmm. You want to make this their weekly stop. Exactly. And then even better is like, we hear it all the time. Like guests go one night to one restaurant, then the next night to another restaurant. And then they, they go on this like, Oh, we can go to all rest, all the, let's go to all the Epiphany Farms restaurants in one week. And, and I'll get an email. Like we went to all <laughs> your restaurants. They were all fabulous. Thank you so much for what you guys are doing. It's just like, it's the coolest feeling in the world. So Mike has a hard time, like, because of the different diverse concepts. And, you know, it's, it's a weird thing. because like when you're constantly plugging away, sometimes you lose people. It's like, if you're always posting, you know, just like, you got to change it up. And, and mm -hmm. he takes classes and he studies it and he, he researches it. And then overall, my wife, Nanam, is like kind of the, 
the temperature gauge. She's like the brand ambassador. So mm-hmm. she's always the one that's, you know, maybe she didn't like the way it looked or it didn't come off. It didn't feel like an, a, an old bank post. It should have been an epiphany post. Then she'll like veto, she'll delete it. And then send an email to us saying like, Hey, just deleted this post. Can you make these adjustments and then repost? Mm-hmm. And so she's the one that's like really watching the brand and making sure that it's packaged in a way that is representing that location's ideology the best. Mm-hmm. And we're really lucky to have someone like her that's able to kind of like watch over things for us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the other thing with the farm is that you're vertically integrated. Talk to us a little bit about the pluses of that. Um, well, I, you know, I love the fact that I collect the food waste and that mm-hmm. I personally dump it into my compost pile. I, my chefs, I don't think like it because I, you know, I'm, I'm sending them messages saying like, uh, why the hell is there uh, an unpeeled <laughs> cucumber in the compost? Or <laughs> yes, why did I find six pairs of chopsticks in the compost today? You know, that type of thing. And, um, we use metal chopsticks up at the, at a couple of the restaurants, but the, uh, I, I love the closed loop waste stream. I, mm-hmm. I really love being responsible for that food waste. I think, you know, restaurant food service, you really got to pay attention to your waste and you got to reuse everything and you got to be really, really efficient. And there's no better way of managing that than taking ownership of looking through that food waste and then, you know, adding carbon to it and turning it into a nice hot compost pile that's going to make your soil better. And Mm -hmm. so that's the coolest thing. It's a mess. It's very difficult. There's tons of um, rules and regulation behind it. It's a very gray area in this, in the state, in this country. So it's challenging and it is a liability, but I feel like it's, our responsibility like we have to do a good job at that mm-hmm. other than that it's you know the breeding side of things you know calling animals is not a problem um yeah. we, brought in, we brought in four hogs yesterday to slaughter and they go to the usda slaughter facility they get they get slaughtered they get um uh, evis- they get scalded eviscerated hung and stamped and then we ship everything whole animal to the restaurant well then ah. then that team ages it how they want to age it and then they put a knife to it and the chefs that are doing the butchery are chained to send the livestock manager as well as me a picture of the eye so that we could then rate the color and the marbling. And so there's this feedback loop that is like almost immediate. Mm. And that I love. I love the fact that I can actually work towards breeding something that's better. And that's the reason why we breed all of our breeding stock and why we do everything in house is so we can have a really, really tight closed loop when it comes to that type of production. And so like in the winter, for instance, we bring our hogs to like 250. We want to hang them a little bit bigger because they have a larger fat cap. Mm -hmm. So we have a nicer eye and, you know, we just, with the chickens, we're trying to get a better system so we can have more consistent birds. And so like, that's, that's a big deal. And one of the issues with the chickens is that we're raising, you know, last year was 5,000. This year it's almost 7,000 broilers, but we can only raise them in six months on pasture, but we need to have chicken at the restaurants for 12 months. Oh, so the storage. Storage, lots of freezers. Back in the day, we'd have kind of like these, we'd have like secret storage spaces where we'd store all the meat. But now we luckily have been able to invest in walk-in coolers at each of the restaurants. And so Mm -hmm. each restaurant purchases their meat for the remainder for the end of the season sometimes they can't pay for it because their cash flow is a little tighter but that's fine because it's it's you know it's accounts receivables and the the farm will get that income in the winter when the restaurants can pay for it and then it helps the farm because we don't have that much in sales at during the winter so Mm -hmm. that it it, they do complement each other really well in that respect at the same time there's some serious negatives to it um for instance, if I raise, I can think of an example of just, you know, raising purple top turnips in a bed that just didn't have the proper nutrition to produce a good quality crop. And so you're harvesting these like small, pithy, diseased, insect infested, mm-hmm. you know, turnips. And it's like, well, I can feed them out, but they are also usable. So you ship them to the restaurants. And then now the restaurant is forced to use the product that's substandard because that's what you grew. And they're and- very upset yeah they're upset and then or they just don't know or you're just like yeah 
and, and then you put all this time. So like you put all this time into growing it. Right. And then you harvest it and then you ship it and then you have to store it. And then maybe I, I harvested too much. So I slam the restaurants with too much product. So then I'm going back in two weeks later and I'm like, Hey, you guys didn't order lettuce. What's going on? They're like, well, we have too much lettuce. And then I go into the walk-in and I have a huge Lexana lettuce and half of it's rotting. Mm-hmm. And it's like, Oh my God, these great intentions have, you know, paved the road to hell in a lot of ways. Yeah. So, so that's one thing that we're trying to get better at is, is really dialing in, you know, what is good enough? Like we don't need to have 300 heads of lettuce a week. We need a hundred. So let's Mm -hmm. just make sure that we have a hundred heads 52 weeks out of the year. Mm -hmm. And -hmm. and that's one thing that, you know, you can always get better at, but successional planting and not having too much is, you know, having too much is almost just as bad as not having enough in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. So let's talk about beginning farmers. Um, what is the biggest mistake that you see them making? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, uh, well, I, I would say the first thing is, is having a realistic understanding of how much time and how much money it's going to cost. Mm-hmm. That, that's something that I, I was very naive to. I didn't understand. Um, but it was also, it was, it was cool. Like it, it allowed me to grow as a grower and, and as a chef. Um, and, but it, it, it was a long, you know, painful, you know, time of like making a lot of mistakes and wasting a lot of money. But at the end of the day, I was just like, okay, Hey, I learned let's just move forward. And so staying positive and taking notes um, not giving up on things, you know, I, a great farmer in this area, Henry Brockman, who's a, a big time idol of mine. Uh, I, I visit his farm and I just go walk it to kind of see where they're at compared to my farm. And he always tells me he doesn't give up on a variety unless he's tried it for three seasons. Mm. And, and I really believe in that. So I don't give up on techniques or systems or varieties unless I've given them a good three, three season run. Um, that that's big. And I, I could think of like the first year I planted garlic and uh, you know, I learned I could grow garlic. And then the next year I was like, oh, we're gonna grow five acres of garlic and a hundred varieties. And we, you know, we find a guy that, you know, invested in getting a seed. We had a hundred varieties of garlic. We had five acres in a field. We turned it over. We got ready to plant. We planted it, but yet we didn't do our due diligence to making sure that there was adequate nutrition. We mm-hmm. didn't get rid of the perennial weeds. We didn't have the ability to cultivate five acres. We didn't have the ability to mulch five acres. And so we ended up harvesting like maybe less than a 10th of it. And it was all subpar and we lost most of the varieties. It was a huge waste of time and money, but it was also a huge lesson. It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, start small and and prove that you can do it and understand what it takes. And, and I also, I think that I, I, I always would under, I wouldn't make sure nutrients were there. I was always thinking that a sustainable farmer, a regenerative farmer doesn't need to feed the soil because we're just going to do it organically. And Mm -hmm. that is not the case. It's like, you really have to make sure, you know, I I forget where I learned this. It was at a conference somewhere, but they're like, you know, the cup not only has to be full, but you have to have a full cup on top of that of nutrients so that when that crop is done, taking all the nutrients out of that plot, it didn't, go below the first cup. Like if you, if you dive into that first cup of, of the solid nutrient bank, then that's when you're open for disease and insects and pathogens and viruses. But if you can really make sure you got everything you need and then some, then your, your crop can be happy. And, you know, so I mean, we could talk forever and there's so many resources now, but it's just like, if your crop, you know, if your soil's not there, just don't go so heavy with your population, you know, get more airflow, widen Mm -hmm. your rows, uh, do less space between plants, th- th- that kind of stuff. And so I think not understanding soil nutrition and how to fertilize was something that I think has held me back a lot. And I, I still feel like a novice in that respect. Mm-hmm. What encouragement would you go back and give your new farmer <clears throat> self? Encouragement. Um, yeah, you know, just, just don't, don't allow the naysayers to hold you down. Like, you got a dream, you got a vision. Um, you, you know, if you have passion and desire to, to do something, then, then do it. And when you hear, you know, people doubting or when there's negativity or when you're in tough times, it, it's like, allow that to fuel your passion and make you excited about the opportunity. And don't allow that challenge to cripple you. Just mm-hmm. move forward and get better. And I, you know, take a, take a look at yourself and, and, and how do you get better? You know, it's like, 
every day I wake up, it's like, how am I going to lead 200 people without being in the best shape? I got to be great. I got to do great job. I got to be happy. I got to be healthy. I got to be well rested. And so I really focus on making sure that I am becoming better to then expect my team to get better. Mm -hmm. And so that's something it's, you know, it starts at the top and and if you're if you're not doing a good job or at least challenging yourself and pushing as hard as you can then you're not going to be able to um you're not going to be able to succeed you know something i interviewed um javin yesterday and he said something i think he heard it from dakota cohen he said inoculating yourself against others biases there you go yeah Yep. Yeah, not letting, not listening to those naysayers, you know, making sure that you have your feet firmly grounded with who you are, what you're doing, why you're doing it, not letting others dissuade you who aren't getting the right information. Exactly. Yeah, that is, that's an awesome way to put it because it's, it's, it's really easy to be shut down. But if you can, you know, if you can kind of just have your eye on your goal and just keep working towards it and, and you know what, I mean, let's face it. It's not, it's not pretty. Like you got to work your ass off. You've got mm-hmm. to push really, really hard. And, uh, you know, nowadays, you know, I have Clover, Comfrey and Morris are my kids. Um, Clover's eight, Comfrey's six, Morris is three and a half. And so I'm realizing that I can't work 20 hours a day. I've got mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. do a better job being there for them. And so I'm starting to try to get better at like a work-life balance. Um, but I don't think about trying to separate them. I think about how do I integrate them more, more efficiently, you know, so because the kids love the work side, they just want to be there with you. They love it. And even though we're moving off of the farm, we're still going to have the kids get dropped off by the bus here at the farm. So they can get here at 330. They can find me in the fields, come hang out with me, work with me until a little bit, you know, before dark. And then we can go home uh, and have dinner and, and call it, call it good. But yeah, giving them opportunity and, you know, when we had Clover, we had just bought that house in Bloomington and it was just such a godsend that we were able to raise our child on the farm, eating mm-hmm. great vegetables, eating good protein. Uh, and, and the kids are just, they're awesome. And they're just, they're, they're inspiring. I love that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's really what pushes me to make it, make it work. Yeah. Yesterday I went down to the field and I was doing some cleanup for the season and uh, our two and a half, almost three-year-old Simon came with me and he spent the entire hour with a stick fighting a um a stone pile you know just hitting the stone pile climbing the stone pile he was having just a fabulous time just being out there with me so yep. yeah that's you know that's the thing i think i think i like what you said there is you know you don't want to like oh i can only work eight hours on the farm and yes i know those farmers that do that and i applaud them that's great but i also want to i want to build the farm work-life balance where you you just enjoy every minute of your day doing what you do around the farm or being in the farm with your family. Exactly. And, and I, I like to not use the word work. Like if I don't say work, it's not drudgery. I'm having fun. I'm spending time. I'm enjoying it. Like, mm-hmm. like I'm not working. I'm, I'm like living my dream. This is, this is magic. This is a miracle. And like, let's just enjoy that and enjoy that challenge and stay positive because mm-hmm. you got to psych yourself into it. If you're, you know, people think that you're, you're born with passion. It, it, you can train yourself. You can mm-hmm. teach yourself how to be in a mindset that allows you to be more productive. And, mm-hmm. and so that's, I think really, really important is just, you know, reminding yourself to smile and enjoy and take pictures or notes of it and be like, you know what, this is what I dreamed. I'm fulfilling that I am succeeding and, and it's going to get better. So let's just keep on moving forward. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let's change gears quite a bit here. The state of Illinois is not necessarily known for, um, I would say, I guess, regulatory freedom. How has that affected you? The, um, it's it's been a little challenging. Uh, I think you know there's some things in place like uh, we used to want to like slaughter all of our own chickens and do everything on site, but we we couldn't because of selling it to commercial. Uh, restaurants and there's still some big time regulatory issues with the composting and, and uh-huh. taking food waste from a commercial establishment to a farm. Um, I, I have a little bit of an advantage, right? Like I, I meet our mayors and our senators and our, our um, you know, representatives and they come to our restaurants and uh-huh. then 
they look mm-hmm. for our, our restaurant as like a gathering space at times. And so, you know, I, I really play into that. I, I, get, I want them to know me as a person as well as a business owner, and I want to take care of them. And so I know that if there was ever a big time issue, I, they have my back. Mm-hmm. And, and so with the regulatory agencies, whether it's the egg, egg inspector or the, uh, the meat and poultry inspector or the vegetables inspector or local health department, um, I'm really upfront with them. I'm very open and transparent and I make a point to reach out to them on a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Now, there's some things that once you study the code and once you actually understand how it works, there's some things I would rather ask for forgiveness for than bring to their attention. <laughs> but you have to be open to that dialogue and you have to be, you know, it, it's, it's a game, you know, that, that's the way I look at it. It's a game. And I think as a chef, we're, we're taught how to deal with this game because everyone has health department coming into the restaurants and, and telling them. And so what, the way I look at it is I have a third party consultant coming to my farm and is giving me feedback and insight on how I can get better. They're mm-hmm. not going to shut me down. They're not going to put me in a business. At least it's not their intent. And I didn't have to pay for it. And so I really try to make the experience something that is going to benefit the, the team or the company uh, or the facility in some way. So for instance, like if a health inspector is doing a, a walkthrough with us, the rule is, is that as soon as an inspector is on property, you cannot leave their side. You have to be with them. We, mm-hmm. we have like a fire drill that we practice with anything that we know might be questionable. We have a plan in place to get it out of site. Mm, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then the other thing is, is you have to understand how you're graded. So like a health department, if, if they're going to give you a score and every state and county is different, but in, in most counties, what happens is, is if they, they dock you for something and then they find it somewhere else, they don't compound. You just, uh-huh. you get docked for it. Right. So let's say a cook doesn't label a product and they don't have a date on the, on the container. Well, If we're then at another station and there's something else that's not labeled, I know that that's not going to get me a lower score because Mm -hmm. we were already docked for that. So then I'll even point it out to the inspector and say, hey, you see this? They didn't put the label on that either. Do you mind making note of that again for me? I really want to be able to Mm -hmm. pound this into them. So I kind of play into how they're grading me and and, and help them out and, and, and allow them to feel like they're on my team. Mm -hmm. And, And when I do that, I, I feel like we're, we're, we're more secure. We're not at risk because they like us. They appreciate us. They, they like working with us. They like mm-hmm. coming to our farm and, and being entertained and inspired. But when you put up that wall and you're just like, I don't believe in regulation. You shouldn't be on my property. Like they hate that. Mm-hmm. That's going to get you into so much more trouble. And so I'd rather just work through it with them as a partner and, and try to, to show them that, hey, like we all have great intentions. We're not trying to do anything illegal here. We just want to survive and make this world a better place. So let's mm-hmm. do that together. And that's, mm-hmm. that's kind of the, the dialogue and narrative that I go through with them. Is it true that they're always trying to find something? And so I've heard Absolutely. that. So in some cases, it's actually good to give them something so they don't you know, write you up for something that's a little bit more questionable. I mean, that's a technique. Like, you know, <laughs> like, you know like leave the handrail off for like a building inspection. So like when they show up, like, Hey, you got to put the handrail up and then they stop digging. I mean, I I think there's a certain, you know, there's a certain point, there's a certain aspect of that. But, um, I mean, are you intentionally doing that? I, I, I hope not. I hope Mm -hmm. that it's not the way it is, but, um, you know, that they are going to find something and and Mm -hmm. that's their job. And you know what, do you really want them to come and not give you any insight for improvement? No, yeah. I, I want to know how to get better. So let us know what we're doing great. Let us know what we're not doing great. And then I always like to, you know, just like when you go to an interview, you should interview the interviewer. Same uh-huh. thing with a regulatory agency. You should interview them. Like, how, how do you think we're doing? Are we doing uh-huh. better than other farms? What are some great examples of other establishments that are doing a better job? I'd love to go there and meet them and, and study their systems. And so, you know, like you go to a doctor's office, you pay for a visit. It's like, you don't just show up and listen and then walk out, you know, you prepare your questions and you get your money's worth out of that experience. Mm -hmm. And so you have someone that goes to hundreds of farms in the state. You know what? You better learn a lot from them coming to your farm and you should thank them for visiting your farm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Where do you see your future? I mean, obviously you may have, you know, some top secret plans, but like, what's your big vision in the next 10 years? 
Um, in the next 10 years, I, I'd like to level out. I'd, I'd like to, I, I want to become a little bit more efficient at managing like a team of like 250, 260 people. I, um, I, I want to open a, we were, we're thinking about launching a delivery service for the restaurants so we can do home delivery for the farm as well as the products uh -huh. that come from the restaurants. And we do have a concept on you, which I talked about is our most successful concept concept. I want to do an Anju express. Um, that is like a really small location, but we have scooters that deliver pizza and sushi and ramen and wings. Uh -huh. Um, and then Harmony is our big project right now. That's a new concept, the Korean barbecue. We bought the building. We've been working on it for a year and a half and we're trying to open this summer. So Harmony is going to be a big one. Uh, we are, I'm starting to think like, just to like, just in case, uh, Harmony as well as Anju are franchisable concepts. So if for some reason things go south and the farm to table, you know, if I, if I like, if it's just too hard to try to grow everything or we just cannot compete or we just can't get our economy of scale figured out and, and actually mm -hmm. raise crops profitably, then what does that look like? And so, you know, I am thinking like, okay, well maybe Harmony can, can be franchised and sold to help be seed money for the rest of the company. Um, the estate, you know, was a huge investment for us mm -hmm. uh, moving out of this home turning into the bed and breakfast, having a regional agro-tourism destination is, is, is really big. But that's it. I really wanted to stay here and do these projects and then be good with that until my kids are in college. Mm -hmm. I think once the kids are in college and they go off, then I'm going to be a little bit more interested in going around the world and either doing this system elsewhere or helping other people adopt these types of systems. Mm -hmm. and, and I, and I do see that as like maybe a way for me 10 years from now to monetize my 20 years of experience in this mm -hmm. industry uh, or in, in the farm to table kind of realm. But I, I also, I'm really happy with what I'm doing and where I'm at. And I, I love it. I'm like, I, I really love the challenge of every day and I love what I'm doing and I love the, this journey that I'm on. And I, I feel really like not only blessed, but a little selfish in the way that I've been able to create this vision, execute it and now be successful at it. And it's, it's, it's really inspiring to me still. And I think that it's something that a lot of people can follow and I want to be an open model and I want to teach other people and show them these techniques. And I also want to prove that it's possible because, you know, like one of the big, my, I, I didn't mention earlier, but Dan Barber, Stone Barnes, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh, Huge uh -huh. idol of mine. Like I love Dan Barber. I was going to go work for him before I started Epiphany Farms. I've been to Stone Barnes now a few times and I want to be the Stone Barnes of the Midwest, but I want to do it with out being a non-for-profit. I want to do mm -hmm. it without a big handout. I want to prove that this system can pay for itself and be profitable. Mm -hmm. If we have more profitable examples, then it's going to be much easier for us to increase the local production, be a more resilient food shed, and, and to be a more successful industry. And so we need more models. I'm desperately looking for people that have proven that they can run this type of establishment profitably. And, uh -huh. and that's what we should be really celebrating because if you can do that, um, then we really can change the world and re-envision the food landscape of the future. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. If you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? Finger weeder. Okay. Now, do you have that on a, like a, a, a four wheel tractor or is that just like on like the two, like a, a uh, walk behind? I, I haven't got the walk behind yet. I, I, uh, I broke down three years ago when we, when we bought this property and we scaled up our, our acreage, I bought a Colt Cress uh, three row. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, so I, it was a very expensive tool. I think it was like $12,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but man, I think our, our ROI was like less than six months. It was definitely one season ROI when it came to um, displacing uh, yeah. field cultivation. Hand, hand yeah. Cultivation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you just need to belly mount it on one of those new tractors that uh, like Tillmore has. And yeah. it'll, take, it'll take you right to the next level. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and I mean, and I'm, I'm lucky in this region, we have a farm named uh, Prairie Earth Farms. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Hans, Hans yes. And Bishop. Yeah. And, and, and Hans is like a cultivating genius. And so yes. 
he's 45 minutes from me. I'm always kind of like, you know, we, we're, we, we kind of partner and we work with each other. We buy a lot from them and uh, we, we go in on purchasing like potting soil and yep. fertilizers and stuff. And, uh, and he is like so ahead of the game when it comes to, to cultivation. So I'm always kind of like keeping an eye on him, but we, it's a two man setup. So we do have to cultivate with two people. But I mean, we're able to, you know, really cover some ground and, and you know, kind of, you know, destroy a lot of weeds, which is always a fun thing to do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I, the biggest thing, though, and I, I'm, I don't know if, you know, beginning farmers like, you know, you really got to weed before you see the weeds. Like mm-hmm. it, it's like this weekly scratch is is more of what you're doing than a weeding per se. And so, you know, that was a big mistake early on was waiting to get to feel, to get to rows before they, you know, when they took over. And your yeah. advocacy yeah. is really poor if you go in and, into a plot too late. You got to get in there early. Yeah, we actually, this summer, I'm not sure exactly when we're airing it, are trying to have a four-part series on like cultivation, deep dive into cultivation. We've got some fascinating and amazing people lined up to deliver that. We've already done a couple of the interviews. But yeah, that is such a key. And I'm glad you brought that up, Ken, is that you have to, you want to cultivate, not weed. And cultivate means you're cultivating when you don't see the weeds. Exactly. And it's so it's like effortless. It's fun. It makes mm-hmm. it, it, it takes the drudgery out of gardening and farming. And so, you know, a good cultivation strategy and a good program is I mean, it's priceless. That's what I really think allows your farm to be profitable in a mm-hmm. lot of ways. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. All right. Something you said earlier, did I get my money out of this interview with you? <laughs> <laughs> Um, you were talking earlier about the inspectors, you know, always trying to do that. So is there anything else that you'd like to say before we wrap up, I guess? Um, you know what? I, I don't know. I, I think, uh, there's a lot of passion, um, in the world right now. And, and I, I don't think we're doing a bad job. I really, you know, it's, it's not a black or white, you know, future. We, it's not, you know, organic or conventional. It's not, you know, corn, soybean farms or diversified farms. It, it's, it's really about us all working together. And um, we should be really, we should be proud of, of how far we've taken this movement in the last 10 years, because I think a lot of the guys that have been doing it for their whole lives and they, they set it all up. But I mean, we've, we've had a lot, of progress and just listening to casual conversations and uh, hearing what people are talking about. I feel like the dialogue in our society is finally talking about the right stuff. And I, I don't think we're doing a bad job. And I don't think our job in society today is to fix everything. I think what it is, is about, is about changing direction. And we just mm-hmm. need to understand that we, we, we're going to change direction. And, you know, I, I just want this place to be moving a better direction for when my kids get into industry and when they grow up. And, um, you know, we really should just enjoy ourselves a little bit more and smile and have fun, throw some good high fives um, and, and enjoy the moment because we, we've come a long way and we have an amazingly diverse, wonderful world and our ecosystem, even though it's being challenged, it is mother nature is, is really resilient Uh and we're going to figure this out. I, I believe that the second half of this century is going to be an era of refinement. We've always been trying to provide for more people. Population growth has always been something very difficult for our, our species, but you know what, at the second half of the century, it shows us we're going to level off and when we level off, we're no longer trying to feed more people. We're just trying to feed the same amount of people better. Uh-huh. And I, I really feel optimistic about the future. And I don't see value in, in being negative about it. So I, I think just, you know, smiling, enjoying your day, having fun and moving forward is, you know, is, is great. And so just keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, that was great. Ken, thank you so much for coming on today. And where can people find out more about you and your work? Uh, epiphanyfarms.com is probably the best spot. You can also uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, each of the restaurants, but Epiphany Farms and then my Facebook account. I'm pretty active on Instagram and Facebook. It's Ken Mishka or Ken R. Mishka. Uh, come come check us out. Come visit and, uh, and you know, keep going. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely. We've got to go to Chicago um, maybe later this year. And um, I'm going to absolutely try to convince my wife to detour south and uh and spend a night or two in your area so i can eat at least one if not two of your restaurants <laughs> well we'd appreciate that so thank you very much yeah thank you. Hey, Thriving Farmers. Next week on the show, Lisa Kiravist joins us, who is a national advocate for women in agriculture and 
She does a lot with value added products in the kitchen. So she's written several books. Her latest toolkit is out about value added, such things as like um, uh, using like zucchini and breads and that kind of stuff for farmers. So it's a fascinating interview. She's been in the space a long time, done a lot with Moses. And uh, her latest project is the start a farmstead bakery. So we talk all about that. It's a fabulous interview. Can't wait for you to join us next week and have a listen. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.